pray, Lord God, that you would bring breakthrough, Lord, that you would bring answers, Lord God, that you would meet your children right where they are. Father God, whether they're on mountaintops today, Lord, or whether they find themselves in valleys, Lord Jesus, would you minister, Lord? Would you bring breakthrough, Lord? Would you bring answers, Lord God? Lord, we give you this time. We give you this moment. Holy Spirit, have your way in this room and in our hearts. Pray, Lord God, that you would hide me behind the cross and speak boldly to your children. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Man, good morning, guys. My name is Manny, and I have a, the privilege of being the pastor here at Cross Point, and I have an even greater privilege of sharing the greatest news of all, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for our sins, and because of that great sacrifice, we are made new. We are made whole. We are made complete. I say it every Sunday, and I never get tired of saying it. I hope y'all don't get tired of hearing it, but welcome to the church. Welcome to the church. And when I say church, it's more than a building. I say it all the time, but there are plenty of buildings in our community. There are plenty of buildings in this city. There are plenty of buildings in this state and in this nation and around the world, and yet the world doesn't seem to change. Why? Because God is not counting on a building to change the world. God is counting on the Christian to change the world by how they live out their faith every Monday through Sunday when they wake up and when they get out of bed. So welcome to the church. We have been focusing on what it looks like if we, the church, were moved by the compassion of Jesus, which would in turn encourage the church to be intentional about being the kind of neighbor who would make a radical kingdom impact for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We asked a couple weeks ago the question, who is your neighbor? We, we dove in on that a little the, in week one where we talked about how Jesus defines neighbors and it's not just the person you live across the street from. It's not just the person who lives next door to you, but it's the person who God is calling you to be the hands and feet of Jesus for. That's your neighbor. That's your neighbor. And so another question for today is, how will they know that you are their neighbor? How will the world know? How will your city know? How will your community know that you were hand-selected by God to be their neighbor? How will they know? How will they know, church? Especially when, when our culture continues to push us into isolation. Let's be real. Our culture continues to push us into isolation. Our culture continues to push us inside the four walls of our house. Continues to push us away from others. It pushes us away from community. Our culture continues to push us on an island. You know how it is where you can order everything you need from Amazon. You can order everything you want to eat from Grubhub, except for my address for some reason. You, you, you can order a new car through Carvana and don't even have to step foot onto an actual dealership. We can talk to the postal service or the Amazon delivery guy right through our ring camera without ever having to answer the door. And if we keep it all the way real, we tend to roll our eyes when someone rings our doorbell unannounced. We roll our eyes. It's, it's just something that, that we struggle with. You see, it's a lot different than the first church. You see, the first church exploded in numbers daily. Why? Why did they explode in numbers daily? Because they had genuine community. They, they broke bread together. They hung out together. They were in the word together. They prayed consistently together. Guess what? They simply just did life together. And they were around people constantly. The first church was around people constantly. Now, in all reality, churches struggle to grow. Why? 
They struggle to grow now more than ever because the Christian is intentionally getting farther and farther and farther away from people. Farther and farther away from community. We run away from what was my dad's favorite word in the Bible, koinonia, which is the Greek word for fellowship, true, genuine fellowship. The reality is that our, our God wants us to live our Christian lives on purpose, on purpose, representing him in the best possible ways, using our lives to point people to Jesus. We as Christians are tasked with being salt and light. We are called called by Christ to do whatever it takes to point people to the one true God. And here's the thing. While preaching has its place, living out the good news daily will inspire those around you to start asking questions like why? Why? There's something different about my coworker, there's something different about my classmate, there's something different about my uncle or my auntie, there's something different about my grandmother. I can't really seem to understand what it is, but there's just something different about that person. There's always a genuine joy on them, a joy that isn't change with their circumstance. There, there's, there's something different about them they seem to have a, a peace that surpasses all understanding, even in the midst of tragedy, even in the middle of heartbreak. They still seem peaceful. How? And here's the thing, church. The world doesn't know it yet, but the answer to all of those things that make you different, that make you stand out, they're all found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today we'll be in Matthew 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are, are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Man, Jesus goes in and starts presenting foundational statements about what it should look like to be a Christ follower. These statements, man, they were, they were countercultural, not only in Jesus' day, even more so in 2024, counter-cultural. These words were not about self-preservation or looking out for one's best interest or if you're not first, you're last. You see, Jesus, he celebrates why his followers are different. He celebrates why the Christian should look different and act different from the rest of the world. He celebrates not the things that we do to blend into culture, but rather the, the things that we live out to emulate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You see, when Jesus starts sharing, the, these people are blessed, not because of money, power, respect, no, the, these people are blessed because they're, they're, they're teaching and, 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 and Jesus explains it, that their, their lives are about following after God. They're, they're not blending in with the times as the world teaches, but rather because they have learned that God is good and he is worthy to be praised and he is worthy to be trusted. Let's be real. You think the world celebrates the poor? No, it doesn't. The world rolls its eyes at the poor. The world says, man, this city would be a lot cleaner if it wasn't for all these homeless. You think the world cares about those who mourn? You think the world cares about the meek? Let me help you with that. 
No. They don't. But the Christian should. The Christian should. The world may not. But the Christians should. Matthew 5, 6 through 10. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the, the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Man, the, the Greek word makarios, actually translated as blessed, was used often throughout the Bible to express God's favor and reward for the faithful. Man, if you've been attending church long enough or you grew up going to Bible school or, or Sunday school or Wednesday nights, then you've probably heard many sermons and learned much about the Sermon on the Mount. You learned a bunch about the Beatitudes. I mean, could you imagine what an impact we would make on the world and in our communities if we actually started taking these teachings that we heard since we were six or seven years old, these teachings of Jesus, and we decided, you know what? I'm going to put these into practice. You know what? I'm actually going to focus on what Jesus is saying and try to live it out every day. Man, we can, we can read this piece of scripture as a how-to or as a, a blueprint for what we should be aiming for as Christians. But also in, in this text, Jesus is saying that blessed are those who are already living this way. They're already blessed. They should be celebrating that while the world may look down at their current condition, while the world may look down at their, their selflessness, their humility, their humbleness, their hunger and thirst for righteousness, while the world looks down on that, your God in heaven sees it all and he's well pleased. He's well pleased. You see, if you're, if you're going to be the type of neighbor that, that, that brings glory to God, guess what, church? That means that we need to ask God to help us see what he sees every day. We need to ask him to help us see what he sees. And then not only to, to see what he sees, but that we would pray for him to give us the courage we need to step up and step out into where he's calling us to be, his hands and feet for the person who lives next door or for the person who lives three miles away or for the person who lives 15, 20, 40 miles away because your neighbor is not dictated by who lives across the street from you. Your neighbor is dictated by who you've actually stepped up and decided to be a Christian to. That's your neighbor. Our neighbors, church, need peacemakers in their lives. Our neighbors need people who are pure in heart in their lives. Our neighbors desperately need merciful people in their lives. Man, my favorite Christian rapper, KB, dropped an album on Friday, and in one of the songs on there, it's the last song on the album, it's called I Love uh, man, I've had it on repeat just about all weekend, and it, it spoke so, so loud and boldly to me. In, the, in this verse, he says, I ask God, why do you allow poverty? The weak under siege. Lord, where was your relief when you could intervene? The next verse got me. God then looked at me and said, I was going to ask you the same thing. I was going to ask you, Christian, the same thing. He continues, he says, good men who produce that, ask where God, ask where was God, and God asks, where were you at? And he continues to say, what if God's plan is to move through you when you act? 
So there are many things in your community, there are many things in your society, there are many things in your city that we just drive around and we roll our eyes at and we're like, come on, man, when is this going to change? When will this change? What if God is waiting on you saying, when are you going to go? When will you love? When will you invite? When will you reach out? When will you step out of your comfort zone? When will you meet that need? Man, God can do it all without you, but guess what? He wants to do it through you. He wants to impact your school district through you. He wants to impact your neighborhood through you. He wants to impact your city through you. God wants to impact the world through you. Through you. What if God's plan is to move through you? Guess what? When you act, when you move, and we've been talking about it all series long, okay, because you could be the Christian who's sympathetic, but the Christian who's sympathetic is just sympathetic. It's the Christian who's compassionate, where sympathy moves into compassion, and compassion moves the Christian to get up off the bench and do something. Do something. You see a need, meet it. You got a coworker who's struggling, pray for them. You know someone who lost a loved one, you make sure that they're at the top of your prayer list. You know someone who who can't get out and cut their own lawn, you do it. God is waiting on his church to be the church. And it can't be event-based. It's got to be authentic because the world is watching. And guess what they can notice more than anything? When someone is fake. Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, The character traits described in the Beatitudes are not valued by our culture today. They're not valued by modern culture. They weren't valued by culture in Jesus' day. When was the last time you seen a, a Grammy or an Oscar for the most pure in heart, for the most poor in spirit? As a matter of fact, if we keep it all the way real, those are our traits that you would be made fun of at your local school district. You would be ridiculed in school or in life. But the world will never make sense of the kingdom worldview. Never will. Those traits might be described as your classmates as being a loser. That's the worldview. Oh, you're soft. You're a loser. You ain't worth nothing. But those traits describe a citizen in God's kingdom. Jesus then brings insults and and, and spoken malice into the sphere of persecution. And these words, they rang home for the early Christians. They made sense to everyone who was listening. Why? Because in those days, they were constantly in the crosshairs of their community. Their neighbors the religious, and the enemy himself. The the word says, he says to rejoice whenever you're going through persecution. The literal translation means to jump for joy. Listen to how countercultural that is. Listen to how that just doesn't make any sense. Could you imagine someone spewing lies about you or rumors about you? at school or at work or in your neighborhood? And you ima- could you imagine yourself literally jumping for joy? The reality is that if you live out your life unashamed of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, if you live according to the Beatitudes spoken by Jesus Christ, it will absolutely come with hate. It will come with hate. The world won't understand it. It will come with hate. 
In this world, good people will be persecuted because of the values and the character expressed in the Beatitudes are opposite. They're so opposite from the way our world thinks. And so, while, while we look at our lives and, and we analyze just how much hate and, and persecution we get for being a Christ follower, a couple of things should immediately come to mind. Number one, number one, thank you, Jesus, for the freedoms that I have here in this great nation where I can worship in spirit and in truth without the fear of losing my life. Man, we take that for granted. We take that freedom for granted. All the brave men and women that gave their lives and continue to give their lives, all the brave men and women that raised their hand when anybody else would cower and run in order for you and in order for me to have the freedom to worship Jesus Christ on a Sunday service together. That's rare. It's not rare in America, but it is rare worldwide. It's rare. You know how we do. Ah, if I make it, I make it. If not, it'll be all right. Someone to fill me in on what I missed. Do you know that in most of the world, they would do anything to be able to get together in genuine community to worship Jesus? And they can't. They can't. All around the world, there are people who wish that they didn't have to meet underground in bunkers in the forest at one or two or three in the morning to hear the gospel. Could you imagine if we said, hey, update. Starting next Sunday, come to church, 3 a.m. Come hear the word. It's going to be popping, you know, all kinds of good. No one would be here. No one. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not coming. <laughs> That's where most churches meet. In the middle of the night. No lights, no stage, no microphone, no words. Just a hunger for Jesus. Fighting for their lives to maybe hear a couple of pages out of the gospel. Something that we take for granted. Man. It says to rejoice whenever you're going through persecution to jump for joy, man. And here's the thing. We don't want to take our blessings for granted. We don't want to do that. So number one, give God praises that you are here and live here and have freedoms here that most of the world don't have. That's something that we should be intentional about thanking God for. And then number two, does the lack of persecution in your life this morning, does it symbolize more of where you currently live? Or does it symbolize more of how we aren't living according to our calling? Being an unapologetic, loving, merciful, full of grace Christian will come with hate from the world. It will. So my question for the church this morning is the lack of hate that you are experiencing, the lack of hate that I am experiencing, does it say more about the community that we're living in? Love Texas. Or does it point out more about what, how we're not living in our actual walk? You see, the enemy wants to silence the Christian. But the love of the Father will tell you to speak up when the old you would stay shut. The love of the Father will tell you to encourage that brother or that sister in Christ when the enemy lies to you and tells you to mind your business. Stay silent. Stay out of it. And God is like, no, if you love, then you do something about it. 
If the love that I have for you is in you, then you need to turn and share that love with everybody else. How will the world know that you are their neighbor, church, when you care enough to give godly counsel and advice and prayers and petitions when the rest of the world is telling that brother or sister exactly what they want to hear? Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, church. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Man. Jesus then speaks to the believer and he's telling them and he's telling you this morning that you should be salt, church. You should be light, church. And salt and light, they're both have unique functions. You see, salt in Jesus' day was a valued commodity. So in essence, Jesus is saying to the Christian this morning, you have value, you are precious, you are needed. Salt had a preserving influence. In those days, salt was used to preserve meats. Salt was used to, to slow down the decaying process Jesus and his disciples did not have access to an industrial fridge. Jesus and his disciples didn't have the common 2.5 freezers that are averaged in the Texan household. Some of y'all got them deep freezers, boy. You see that special at Sam's? We're good for the year. Jesus didn't have Sam's. There was no deep freezer that was 15 by 15. They didn't have that. And so in those days, salt would preserve everything. Jesus is saying to the Christian that you should have a preserving influence on your culture. You should have a preserving influence on your family. You should have a preserving influence on your school district, on your community, on your neighborhood. You, Christian, you, Christians should be like salt because we should add flavor. Flavor. We should be like the Goya seasoning place in Kroger's. Yes, I must drive the Kroger's to get my Goya because ain't nobody in Liberty City or Kilgore put them in yet. I'm like, listen, man, if I got to drive to Longview to go get some good seasoning, guess what? We're going The one thing about Caribbean food is we flavor everything. Everything. We season everything. Toast, what? Yes, everything. We season everything. A mixture of salt and pepper and garlic and garlic and garlic. Yes, we season everything. And in our culture, everything should taste like something. You go over a family party, hang out, everything should taste like something. Because if it doesn't, no one will eat it. Who made this dip? Why do you ask? No one's eating it. Did you go get the Goya at Kroger's? No. There it is. That's why Steve, stay ready. You invite Steve anywhere. His man bag is finna have the extra large Valentina in it. I don't mean the little, I mean, I'm like, Steve, what are you carrying in that man purse? He came for me hard yesterday. He had all kinds of jokes. Who's laughing now, Steve? I told you I was gonna rewrite the whole end of my sermon. It's gonna be Roast Steve Sunday. He carries a very large Merce. And he's like, man, you got one of those bags too. I'm like, we're not talking about me, Steve. We're talking about you. 
And if I carry a nine millimeter in mine, guess what? It's no longer a man bag, it is a tactical bag. <laughs> I stay ready where you can fit a family of nine in your male purse. He's like, all right, made enough. <laughs> no, it's not enough, Steve. You're chuckling hard all yesterday. <laughs> back to the sermon. Don't worry, we're coming back to you, Steve. You stay right there. We're coming back to you. But we, we season everything. Interesting enough is if you ever watch a Christian movie that's not made by Christians, how do they always, how does Hollywood look at the Christian? How do they portray the Christian? Bland, can't have fun, can't joke around, always wears dockers, takes everything way too seriously. In every movie, they have us look like the dad on Footloose. I'm like, look, homie, I'm Puerto Rican, man. You tell me I can't dance. Like, we, we got a problem. Like, God gave me rhythm. You may want to read what David did. You know what I mean? At least my clothes are staying on, but I'm going to dance. Jesus was always invited to places. People always wanted to be around Jesus. There is no way that that happens if Jesus was a square, if he was bland. Man, I wish you could be a fly on the wall some Sunday mornings. I come in here, the mornings can be rough, and you have an opinionated six-year-old who wants to pick out everything he wants to wear. I'm like, bro, the pants are red, matches nothing. What do I want to wear? I'm like, fine. When people ask, I'm going to say, your mom dressed you. Like, let's, let's get moving. But man, I wish you could see the interactions between our worship team on Sundays. It's some of the, the most fun I have. I walk in here and straighten out all the seats and just get to witness genuine community. They go from singing Journey songs to Disney's favorites. They're laughing and hanging out. Our girls will all sit right here, sometimes with a blankie. And they'll practice and talk and chat. It's amazing to see that genuine community. They're always laughing. They're always cracking jokes. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start recording the conversations between Bentley and Chrislin in that back room. Because it would make for an amazing podcast. Anytime I walk in there, I can't help but laugh. Chrislin be praying to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to, to help find Bentley's missing whatever it was. It's funny, man. Yes, earbuds. Genuine community. Anytime Matt Wallace is up here with the great fireman mustache, in the middle of songs, he breaks out into journey songs. I'm like, Matt, I love it. Don't stop believing. I'm sure Justin is up here like, Manny, you better quit, man. Because every time he does something crazy, I'm like, you won't do that on a Sunday. He's like, double dog dare me. Watch. Watch what I do. I wish you could be on some of the text threads that we have with my brothers in Christ, man, where we can be fully ourselves, where we can joke around with one another, where we could make fun of in community of Steve's preference of nachos. Or Brady needing a kid's menu where we can talk about sports and, and life and being a husband and being a father, where we can be praying for one another, where we can be sharing devotionals for one another, where we can be uplifting and encouraging each other, along with updating each other when the new J's are dropping. I'll tell you right now, if you want to be good on budget, don't be friends with Steve. He's like, Manny, I know your wife said no more shoes, but bro, these come out Friday, 9 a.m. I'm like, Steve, get thee behind me. Unless they're orange and blue, and then keep sending them my way. Man, I don't know what Christians you're running with. But man, I'm blessed by the Christians that I have in my life. They bring life. They give me life. 
They are salt. And if it's football season, some of those buddies could be a little salty. Because most of my friends in Christ are also cowboy fans. Sorry, I couldn't help it. I had to put that in. There's no way I could. I had to, I had to, my bad. It's too soon? No? Wait till the draft? Okay. Love you. It's okay. Keep praying for Dak. He'll get there. And by there, I mean like heaven, like eventually. Because he may not take you past the first round of the playoffs. But it's okay. I'm a Giants fan, man. We haven't been good in ages. I mean, not good at all. I mean, for heaven's sake, Steve's a Bears fan. I mean, we always praying for Steve because he's like, it just doesn't make sense. You can tell he loves Jesus, though, because as bad as they are, and they are bad. Steve, are they not bad? They're bad, bro. Like, they are not good. Like his pizza. Chicago pizza is lasagna, okay? It is not like New York style pizza. Do not go down that road. It's not good. But his team is really bad, but he's always loving. You could tell he loves Jesus because he's like, Manny, we're one player away. And I'm like, Manny, we're one draft away. And I'm like, Manny, we're one receiver away. And I'm like, Should I keep going, Steve? Mr. Chuckles? All funny yesterday. You can tell he loves Jesus. Jesus calls us to be salt. He calls us to be light. Jesus gives the Christian both a great compliment and also a greater responsibility when he says that we are the light of the world. Because that was something he claimed for himself in John 8 and in John 9. Light givers means that we're not only to be receivers of the light of Christ, but we should also be intentional about being givers of that light. Givers of that light. Meaning we we must have a greater concern than ourselves or the bears. We can't just live only to ourselves, isolated and away from people. We must live on purpose for Christ in public We need people to shine the light of Christ on. We need people to show the love of Christ too. See, Jesus never challenged us to become salt and light. He never did. Read that scripture. What did he say? He said, you are salt and light. He didn't say you need to become salt and light. He said, you are salt and light. A key thought in both salt and light. Salt is needed because if you look around this world, It's unfortunately rotting and decaying. And if our Christianity is also rotting and decaying, then there's no hope to preserve this world. Also, light is needed because of the world. More specific, your neighborhood is in darkness. And if our Christianity imitates darkness, then we have nothing to show our neighbor and we have nothing to show our world who is in desperate need of hope. Church, if we're living our lives as Christians on purpose, as salt and light, our neighbors will take notice. I tell you what, when I think of what a neighbor looks like, This week, I was brought to tears when I read something that Ashley Stevenson posted, and I asked her if it would be okay if I shared it with y'all today. It was the perfect illustration of what a neighbor should look like. She wrote, I could not make it through this excruciating time in my life without my people. a neighbor. My best friends, my sisters, my parents, Colton's family, my co-workers, that's a neighbor. Everyone that brought food and donated money, my laundry fairy, 
my housekeepers, AKA my friends, those are neighbors. My pastor and his wife, and everyone that sent texts and messages, the people that still continue to check on me and the kids daily, those are neighbors. From helping me with the kids to laying in bed with me while I cry, those are neighbors. Thank you. And I love you. To whoever anonymously paid for Colton's funeral service. Thank you. Such a generous gift that I'm forever grateful for. Church, that's what being a neighbor sounds like. That's what being a neighbor looks like. That is the purest definition from heaven of what a neighbor does. That's what being a neighbor sounds like, church. That's what being salt and light sounds like, church. By being salt and light, we magnify the name and love and grace and mercy of Jesus right here on earth. Right next door to our neighbors. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so grateful, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Father God, I pray that you would lift our hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would set us on fire, Lord, with your love and your Holy Spirit to be intentional about being the kind of neighbor that brings glory to you, that brings glory to your kingdom, that brings glory to your name. Father God, I pray, Lord, that to this Sunday, that this day, that it would not be something where we walk away feeling convicted, but instead we would walk away being fired up to be the difference that our neighborhood needs, to be the difference that our school needs, to be the difference that our community and our city needs, to, to be the difference that this world needs, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to live out our Christianity on purpose. And Father God, for anyone sitting here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, I pray that they would pray this very simple prayer. Dear God, it's me, and I am a sinner. But I believe that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for me, to resurrect for me. And because of that great sacrifice, I am a new creation. Help me to chase after you all the days of my life. Help me get into discipleship relationships and community so I can learn about your radical love and grow deeper in the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.